It's a bachelor. Well. All right. Had a busy week. I, d I always need coffee. I always need coffee. Why do you think I'm psychotic and I keep going? Like buzzing. Um, yeah, that'd be great. Thank you, Sal. Um, I, I hope I've got a word for you this week. Um, that word would be transformation. Transformation. Now, in bringing about said transformation on a spiritual level, I think we could ask ourselves three questions. Three questions come to mind. One being, well, who's God? Two, who are we? And the third one would be, who are we to God? And indeed, in him. So I'm going to have a little go at answering these basic questions. Simple, but possibly very deep. See where it takes us. Um, in being transformed, and the good Lord knows we all need a bit of transformation, don't we? So let's have a go. Um, it's, got to, it's about making us a little bit more like Yeshua. That's, that's the whole idea, isn't it? Bring in the Word of God, and if, it, and if it's truly the Word of God, it's going to be double-edged and it's going to affect you. It's going to cut you. It's going to pierce you because it's meant to. That's the whole idea, isn't it? Because then it's going to change something. Now, you, you might be totally satisfied where you are with the Lord. You could be fine. Fine. I'm fine. And just cruising along. And that's okay, but some might want to hear from the Lord. You might want to hear God's voice more than just a word or a teaching. Because there's a heap of teaching out there. It's very, very polished, very professional, very nicely packaged. The problem with it is it's not going to hit you here. It's going to hit you here, and you're going to forget it by the time you've got to lunch. That's the problem, isn't it? Because a message is meant to pierce you. It's meant to change you. If you don't, you're not, you're not going to change. You won't. But that's, that's... Sometimes people don't want change, do they? It's not popular these days. Messages hit home. That's not popular. It's almost apologised for these days. I don't think Yeshua ever apologised for his teaching. Not ever. That being said, who then is God? How do we know him? The first thing you need to know about God is you, know, you, you should read your Bible. It's, auto, it's his autobiography. Many, many, many in the body these days don't spend nearly enough time in the Word. Not nearly enough. He is that Word. They'll listen to messages, but they're not getting in the Word. So it's essential. It's essential. Because it's going to talk to you. And it talks about Him a lot. No? And then you get to know His character. Job says, He's got no equal. Who, who can change him? What, what he desires, he does. That's our God. So you've got to understand that you, you, your God's very, very strong and dependent on nothing. And you need to know that if you're going to serve him. 
if he's going to be your God and you're going to give him all your heart, that's the kind of God you need, a God who's, who's wild, who's a, God, a God who's free. He does what he wants, when he wants, however he wants, to whoever he wants. Because he's mighty. He's mighty to save and he is almighty. He is the almighty, right? And Job, 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 <laughs> Job, Job found out in a big way. Some people call him Job. Fishmongers. Anyway, uh, he doesn't change. He doesn't change one bit. He's not changed one bit from the time of Job. Not one bit. We change. We're all over the place. But he doesn't. He's consistently unchangeable. And that really should give you a little bit of security. Shouldn't it? Yeshua's brother, Yaakov, James in your Bible, Yeshua's half brother, didn't pull any punches. Wrote a small letter, but it's power packed. 108 verses, half of them commandments. It's like the Proverbs of the New Testament, it doesn't pull any punches. Very, very poignant, very, very powerful letter. And people get a little bit tilted when they hear commands. It's like, ooh, and he's dragging me under the law. We're free. What, what are you free from? What are you free from? Sin and, sin and death, you, that's what you're free from. You're not free from the commandment to God, are you? Hands up, who can commit adultery here and get away with it? Anybody? Anybody can you know, go and rob a bank. It's the law of Christ now, aren't it? Well, how is that different to the Father? Because it's not. It's really, his commandments are the same. Exactly the same. They're no different. And... There's 1,056 commandments in the New Testament. How are you rolling with them? With your freebie. His name was Yaakov. Jacob. Don't miss that. It's Jacob in the English. Where, where did James come from? King, King Jimmy, maybe? Look, we regard those who persevered as blessed. You've heard of the perseverance of Job, and you know what the purpose of Adonai was. That Adonai is very compassionate and merciful. He's being compassionate and merciful, and when Job's going through what he's going through, we we don't see the compassion and the mercy in it, do we? Till we get to the end of the story. He, he had no clue when he was going through it. He was just being crushed. And you find too, too many who have a Job experience similar to Job. They lost health, wealth, family, his wife, his friends, all turning on him. When he's at rock bottom, giving him a kick in. We, we go through some stuff. It, it doesn't compare to what he went through, really. It doesn't even compare. It's not in the same league. But his, his believing friends came along just to finish him off, didn't they? And sometimes the body will kick you more than the world will but he prayed for him he prayed for his friends at the end because that was his caliber he interceded for them special Job was special after everything that happened he still praised the father in the storm very very blessed at the end of it abundantly blessed at that he lacked nothing 
spiritually and physically. And he lived a full life thereafter, didn't he? So what can you glean from that? You glean Adonai is compassionate and merciful. Fair dues? There's a lot more to glean, but the focus is God's character right now. What about Nehemiah? First chapter, it tells us there's a remnant of people who didn't get exiled, still in Jerusalem, which is in ruins. And Nehemiah, he, he was like the, the cup tester for the king, he was well thought of. He finds out about it, about what's going on in Israel. He's fasting and he's praying. Please, God of heaven, you're great and you're awesome. One who keeps his covenant and extends grace to those who love him and observe his commandments, fasting and praying to the God of heaven. And he says you're great and you always keep your word. Incredibly merciful, incredibly graceful. That's Nehemiah. Moses, at the end of Deuteronomy, he's ready to check out, ready to pass on. But he speaks these words out in the hearing of the whole assembly. It's a song. Deuteronomy 32. I for I'll proclaim the name of Adonai, the greatness of our God. He is the rock. His work's perfect. All his ways are just. A trustworthy God. He does no wrong. He's righteous. He's straight. Straight. Like you get a pool table or a snooker table. It's straight. Isn't it? And you can get a, a pool cue and roll it across and it might wobble. The cue's going to be warped. But the flat table won't be. Declaring his greatness. He is the rock. Nobody would know better than Moses. All the things he saw, the power, the deliverance, the strong tower, his work's perfect, he says. He does no wrong. Nothing that God does is bad. Nothing. All his ways are just. So whatever he permits or he promotes, he will bring good out of. Nothing, nothing gets past his desk. That's a nice ringtone, Michaela. <laughs> <laughs> Merry Christmas. Because <laughs> he's trustworthy and we need to trust him, right? Because he does no wrong, he's righteous, he's straight. Then we get a prophetic psalm, Psalm 18, written by David, under the unction of the Holy Spirit. Speaks of when Messiah comes. I love you, Adonai. You're my strength. Adonai is my rock, my fortress, my deliverer. My God, my rock in whom I find shelter. My shield. The power that saves me. My strong God, I call on Adonai. He's worthy of praise. And I'm saved from my enemies. That's our God. And he knew God very well. Colourful life, but he knew God very well now. Hebrews. Keep your lives free from the love of money. Be satisfied with what you have. For God himself has said, I'll never fail you. I'll never leave you. I'll never forsake you. I'll never fail you or abandon you. And we can say with confidence, Adonai is our helper. And we won't be afraid. What can a human being do to me? That's where we've got to be at. This was written to who? Messianic Jews, right? Jews who believe in Jesus. So what we're doing here is nothing new. Nothing new. It's the oldest faith there is. In, in Christendom, isn't it? This movement's been resurrected. Adonai is your helper. That makes us overcomers. That makes us super conquerors. Somebody wrote that. So we don't have to be afraid. 
What can a human do to you? Well, what's all this about? Being born again. What's your, what's your promise? Hmm? And he gives you peace and e. Bing, 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 bing. So you can't lose, can you? So if they kill you, they free you. That's your mindset. That's the mindset they had to have in the first century. We've got to adopt it. Just, just put the brakes on. There's so much fear these days. So much fear, isn't there? And I taught, I taught a couple of weeks ago about Daniel and the kids. So you've got 300,000 kids in Babylon, not kids, 300,000 people all bowing to a gold statue, don't you? Except three little Jewish kids. And they go, no. Well, we'll kill you. We'll kill us then. But we're not going to bow. What's that? Faith. That's faith, isn't it? Do what you've got to do. I'm not going to change. I'm not bowing to no gold statue. That's faith. And if you, if you can walk in that, what can anybody do to you? What, what's, your, what's your darkest fear? What's, how, how, how's that going to affect you? That's what it's about. Fear is it's debilitating. It can, it can absolutely crush you. Crush you. But you've got to have faith. And if you can walk in that, if you can, if you can feel death, where's your sting? Where's your sting? That's going to make you potent for the kingdom. Isn't it? What's the whole point? What's the biggest commission we've got? To seek and save. That was Yeshua's mission, wasn't it? He came to seek and save. That's our mission. We're supposed to be little Yeshua's. Heaven's supposed to be bursting out of us. And you can only do that when you've got no fear. Phil, when Philip got crucified, he was on the cross for three days. Philip, the, the disciple, for three days sharing. Sharing the gospel. Dying. No fear. Because it's, it's good news. The good news is you, you live forever. That's the good news. Makes you potent in the kingdom of God, sharing the gospel like you've never shared before. That's your calling. We're called to share the good news because it's good news. It's not mediocre news. It's not average to poor news. It's not, oh, I can't be bothered kind of news. Understand your calling, the gift of eternal life you've received on being born again makes you a kingdom of priests and priestesses. And you're called to be and represent God before man. That's who you are. You are not to bow down. You're not to serve them. I'm Adonai, and I'm jealous. Punishing the children for the sins of the parents to the third and fourth generation of those who, what? Hate me. Forget all that generational curse crap. It's for those who hate him. Not those who love him. Displaying grace to the thousandth generation, that's Hebrew idiomatic, for Forever. For those who love me and obey my mitzvot commandments. He's jealous for us. Why is he jealous for us? Because he really, really loves us. He's jealous for your time with him. Spiritually jealous. And if you don't spend time with him, how can you know him? 
How can you have a relationship with him? If, if, if you go away for months and months at a time, what sort of state do you think your marriage is going to be in? Or you come out with, well, love, I'll just see you on Monday afternoon and Thursday night and maybe Sunday morning. How's that going to roll? Oh, and by the way, ring me if you need me. <laughs> it's not going to end well, is it? He's jealous. He's jealous. He sent redemption to his people and decreed that his covenant should last forever. His name is holy and awesome. His name, holy and awesome. Only his name is holy and awesome. So you don't be calling things of the world, regardless of how good they may be, like GT Mustangs or surfboards or pizza or whatever you're into. That's not awesome. God's awesome. Not pizza. What, what you're doing is you, you, you're bringing God down to our level. And it's straight out of the enemy's playbook. He's trying to make you think less of God in this. And I, I know, it, it, Arnie, you're being pedantic. And it, you, you're too conservative. You, you're uptight. You're narrow-minded. Thank you. He is holy and he is awesome. And, and if you have an encounter with him, I'll guarantee you it's going to induce a really large element of awe in you. His name is so very, very powerful. How do we know? John 18. When Yeshua said, I am, <coughs> blew a whole troop back down to the ground. Are you Yeshua of Nazareth? I am, <coughs> boom. Blew him away. He just said his name. And it blew them all out. It would have freaked the Jews out some because nobody knows how to pronounce it. It doesn't matter what, you, what you've seen on the internet uh, on all these nutbags. I don't care what you think. Yehovah, Yahweh, all your sacred namers, whatever they call Yahoo, ha, hoo, ha, hoo, ha, ha, wh whatever you call him, I don't care. You don't know. Nobody knows how to pronounce his name. And if you think you do, you're taking liberties. Who put the A there? And the E there? Who did that? Man. Not God. You're taking liberties you shouldn't really take. And you're not meant to. Because if, if you can do that again, you're going to bring him down and you're going to try and box him in. And that's not going to end well. You're making him smaller. You're making God in your own image. Can't box him in. He's too big. And there's far too much you don't know about him. I, I tell you what you can call him. Here's a, here's a kicker for you. How about you call him Daddy? Call him Abba. Call him Father. How about that? Whatever Yeshua said that night... He must have pronounced it right because it blew people away because there's power in that name. Blew them back. No courtesy drops, no hunky beefcakes in tight t-shirts built up like brick walls there to, to catch you so you don't bang your head. None of that going on. Blew them away.
And people fall down for fun, don't they? It's not, it's not the falling down that matters, though, is it? It's what happens when you're down there. Because if you're down there and it's legit, and that's a big if these days, if it's legit, if you've been bowled over by the Holy Spirit, there should be some sort of transformation going on, shouldn't there? You should come up changed, no? It's got to be legitimate. And there will be legi legitimate change if it's God's in it. I'm sorry if that twists somebody's mail. I don't, I'm not really sorry now, I'm not. I can't say I am because I'm not. Time's getting short, that's why. Time's getting really, really short. He's not slow in keeping his promise, as some people think of slowness. On the contrary, he's patient with you. It's not his purpose that anybody should be destroyed, but that everybody should turn from his sins. He's patient. In the Hebrew, it's more. It's more like he's long-suffering. He's patient with us. He suffers long. So suffering for him. And it hurts him how stupid we can be. Like, if you, you, you might be a veteran parent, like me, and you suffered through your children's teenage years. That, honestly, I, I, I bit through my knuckles. If, you, if you've been through it, you'll know what I'm talking about. Well, that's the same application God's got with us. He must be like, <laughs> like some of the things we do. Far out. They drove me round the twist, my kids, honestly. But it's a hard time. I'm sure I drove my mum and dad round the twist too. Hurtful, heart wrenching stupidity sometimes. When Yeshua went to the synagogue in Nazareth, he started his ministry there. You see that in Luke 4. And he walked in the synagogue and they handed him the scroll of Isaiah. And he, he read, The spirit of Adonai Elohim is upon me, because Adonai has appointed me, anointed me to announce the good news to the poor. He sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom to the captives, to let out into light those bound in the dark, to proclaim the year of favor of Adonai and the day of vengeance of our God to comfort all who mourn. He proclaimed the year of favor and the day of vengeance. So you realize we've got a God whose favor lasts a year. But his vengeance, but a day. Favor comes first as well, vengeance second. That's our God. That's his heart. The heart of God is love and patience. So give him praise to the name of Adonai, servant to Adonai. Give praise. You who stand in the house of Adonai, in the courtyards of the house of our God, praise Yah for Adonai is good. Sing to his name because it's pleasant. For he chose Jacob for himself, Israel, his own unique treasure. He's good. Good. Now, we, we, we throw that word around in English because it's good. It's just good. But in the Hebrew, tov, excellent, magnificent, eminent, superior, nothing greater, choice. It's not a word that gets thrown around in the Hebrew. He's all things and more. So we should give him the praise and the worship now. 
So these are just some of God's perfect character traits. You're going to find them when you read the Word, right? And this is what Adonai says. Who gives the sun as light for the day. Ordain the laws of, for the moon and the stars to provide light for the night. Who stirs up the sea until its waves roar. Adonai is a vote is his name. The Lord of heaven's armies. If these laws leave my presence, says Adonai, then the offspring of Israel will stop being a nation. In my presence forever. This is what Adonai says. If the sky above can be measured and the foundations of the earth fathomed, then I'll reject all the offspring of Israel for all that they have done. Now, as far as I'm aware, the sun, the moon, and the stars are still around. This is the new covenant. It's part of the new covenant. It's God saying, if you don't see the sun, the moon, the stars, then you won't see the Jewish people no more. He's giving you his word and he's telling you, this is how you know I love them. And I'm going to protect them. This, this proves your Bible true. Proves your Bible true. How can you prove your Bible true? Well, they, they can say, well, what's the difference between the Bible and the Quran? And you say, well, well, the Bible's true. So they go, well, prove it. And you go, uh, 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 well, um, um, this, this proves it. Because Shirley and Pam are sat here. God's always going to protect the Jewish people. It says there's always going to be, throughout time, an identifiable remnant of Jews. Now, there's something like 14 million Jews worldwide. Right now, small, small number on the grand scale of things. It would have been easy to assimilate, wouldn't it? Easy to get rid of. And most empires have tried, haven't they? But at some point... There was a guy called Blaise Pascal. He was French, mathematician, philosopher, theologian. Good friends with King Louis. And Louis was struggling with his faith. He, he was struggling to find faith. And he said, Blaise, help me. Prove, prove God to be true. Prove it. And Blaise Pascal said, Your Majesty, the Jew. Maybe he knew his history. Maybe he knew they've got protection from on high. Supernatural protection. But you, you've just got to look at the wars they fought. West Point won't touch them because they can't figure out how they've won. There's nothing to glean because they can't put it down to God. They can't put it down to a supernatural force, but it is. There's a God in Israel that protects them. And a God in Israel that keeps his word. So be strong and be bold. Don't be afraid. Don't be frightened. For I don't know your God is going with you. He'll never leave you. He'll never forsake you. That's a promise to Israel. You can claim that when you're grafted in. And if you're not grafted in, where are you? He's never going to drop you. He told the Messianic Jews in the first century the same thing because he changes not. Pharaoh came after him. Out of that came Passover. Haman came after him, tried to wipe him out. From that came Purim. Antiochus tried. Hanukkah. What we're coming to the end of now. 
Well, the nations are going to come after him again soon. Out of that deal, we're going to have a big wedding feast. Because he's merciful, he's compassionate, and he's caring, and he's loving to his people. He is your praise, he is your God. He has done for you these great and awesome things, which you've seen with your own eyes. Speaking to the children there. But what you need is some personal divine encounters. We should all have them. So what have your eyes seen? He said this to Moses, he's not changed. Not one bit, he's not changed one bit. And you know he's there, don't you? You know he's real. Personally, you know he's real. And he's done something in you, he's delivered you, he's saved you from something. You've cried out at some point, broken, desperate. And you're still here. So you must have some kind of story, some kind of testimony of what, he, of what you've seen him do. And that's powerful. That's a powerful witness. Bearing your own testimony. Because this born again thing is very, very real. Very, very real. I don't know how he does it, but I do know he does it. He does something, and I know it's real. There's, there's no way, no way, 25 years ago, I, I'd have looked forward and seen me here. No way. No way. My, my friend Greg, the rabbi in America, he, he's legit, legitimately got a real deal friend who was a hitman, mafia hitman. Killed people without a blink for money. 20 years in prison, when they arrested him, he had a million dollars in the boot of his car. Real deal. And he's a pastor now. How do you explain that? How does that happen? He's been transformed. That's an undeniable testimony, isn't it? A man so stone cold, hardcore, transformed into a pastor with a massive heart for people. How does that happen? He knows what he's been saved from. And I think the problem people have in general, they well, think, well, I'm not so bad. I'm pretty good, really. Survey says. <coughs> not any of us are that good, are we? That raises the next question then. Who are we? We found out a little bit about God, and he's good, but us, maybe not so much. We think we are, but the Bible principle is that we're, we're on the whole, fundamentally bad, and every now and then we'll do something good. That's fair, isn't it? Jeremiah, he was a prophet, a real one. The heart is more deceitful than anything else. It's mortally sick. Who can fathom it? I had an eye search the heart. I test inner motivation in order to give everyone what his actions and his conduct deserve. You can comprehend the heart of man. Yeah, and, you, and you must have looked at things on the news over the years and thought, wow. How can that be? How can they do that? Mortally sick. Now, some might tell you Jeremiah is speaking of an unregenerated heart, crooked, deceitful, corrupted, backstabbing, treacherous, insidious, polluted. 
but even people with a regenerated heart are capable of all the above and more. Post salvation. A lot less, fair enough. But we're trying a lot harder. And we're a lot more conscious and led by the Holy Spirit, but we're still very, very capable of messing up. You've got to realize that pretty much every day. For the unregenerated heart would say, well, the, the, there's no God. He doesn't see what I do. He doesn't require anything of me. That's deception. That's being deceived. We're not that deceived. We can be at times, but overall, not so much. In regards to who God is, at least. And what he's done for us, as far as redemption goes. We understand the price had to be paid, and God was willing to pay that price, because we, we, there's no way we could. We get that. And because of that, we'll fall in love with him. And then we want to be obedient to him. Nothing to do with salvation. But because of it, we want to work for the kingdom. Because that's what he's called us to do, to seek and save and spread the good news. So we haven't been deceived in that way, but we're far from perfect. And we can mess up. And we can get freaked out and we can get insecure and neurotic and exhausted. Fine. We're fine. If we're being honest, we've got to come to grips with the heart and realize our hearts are sick. Who can discern unintentional sin? Cleanse me from my hidden faults, Lord. There are sins we don't even know we do, secret sins. Not that you do them in secret. You're not even aware of them. There was a focus on the family survey done a few years back. They did a study. And it came out with that 47% of believers, believers, were involved in some kind of pornography. To a degree. Almost half. They, they, some of the some of these survey groups, they, they you know they've got solid reputations, another one found twenty nine percent of believers think it acceptable to watch movies with extreme sexual behavior portrayed. So at that point, how are we different from the world? What's wrong with that picture? We're getting desensitized and we're skipping along a really, really wide road that leads to destruction. Yeshua said that to the body. So it's okay to watch porn and think God's got no problem with that. And then you think you're going to hear his voice. Oh, this film's not so bad. Would you, would you sit there next to Yeshua and watch it? You might think it okay, but the Holy Spirit won't be around. There's a load of churches in, in that boat now. It just doesn't show up. And he, he's been away for that long. They don't know the difference no more. Oh, great service, great music. No God, though. And this pawn deal, that, that it's not just the boys, it's the girls as well. 34% of the Christian community 
So come on church, go pull your socks up some. The heart's mortally sick. Who can understand it? Wasn't wrong, was he? Out of the same mouth comes blessing and curses. Brothers, it isn't right for things to be this way. Jacob again. It's not right. And we all do it. Because it's a tough call to be in the world but not have it it's a tough call but that is the call we're supposed to stand out from the crowd there was, there was a famous picture photograph took in, in Nazi Germany and everybody stood there like that except one bloke who was like this that's who we're called to be that's who There we go. There you are. We're the ones who give our time. We give our talent. We give our treasure. And we don't ask anything in return. And that's, that's really, really weird to the world. Because the world always wants something. It's going to be sickeningly nice, but it'll want something from you. Join something, invest in something, buy something, do something. It's always something. Well, when you share your faith, what, what do you want out of that? All you want is for a soul to prosper. Don't you? And that's a beautiful thing. And we've got to hold on to that. And don't be ashamed of it. A person's own folly is what ruins his way. But he rages in his heart against that annoy. Do you know what that means? It means we make bad decisions and then we blame God for it. We can blame him all we want, but it's our junk and it's, and it's, it's us carrying it. It's our bad decision, it's our consequence, it's our hurts, it's our fears, it's our shame. And it messes us up. So God stirs that little pot some. And what it does, it forces all the bad stuff to come to the surface. And then he can skim it off and purify. Refine you in the fire. We don't like it. Sometimes it hurts. We don't like rocking the boat, but he wants us to get out of the boat in the storm. Walk on the water. But we just like to blame. I always have. It wasn't my fault. It was that woman you gave me. Blame game. It's everybody's fault but ours. He tells us not to do certain things which we, we then go and do and then we blame him when it goes wrong. And then if we do things and they go well, we'll, we'll take the credit for him. But why does he put up with us, really? He saw that the people on earth were very wicked all the imaginings of the hearts were always of evil and he regretted he'd made mankind on the earth and it grieved his heart I'll wipe them out I'll wipe the whole earth out well, not only the humans the, the animals everything start again I regret I ever made them it's heart wrenching isn't it but in Noah he found grace in his sight. He loved Noah.
Sad. Sad he created, regretted it. All he could find was Noah. In Abraham's time, it tells you in Genesis 14, he had 318 righteous men. Elijah's time, there were 7,000 who wouldn't bow a knee to Baal. And you think, well, it's 7,000. That's not many. It's 7,000. Why does he put up with us? Because he's got great mercy. He could and he probably should have stopped us in our tracks, but he didn't because he's incredibly merciful. So now you know God's great, but us, not so much. That being said, there's good news. And that's who we are to him. Fair? As it is, your kingship will not be established. Adonai has sought for himself a man after his own heart. Samuel, John, these are the kind of people the Father wants worshipping him in spirit and in truth. Second Chronicles. For the eyes of Adonai move here and there throughout the whole earth to show himself strong on behalf of those who are wholehearted towards him. Samuel speak, he's speaking to Samuel there. This is Yeshua at Jacob as well with the woman from Samaria. And Second Chronicles is King Asa's reign. But what do you see in the three verses? You see the creator and sustainer of the universe seeking us out. Searching, desiring, even demanding. And he's doing that to the extent he's saying to the enemy, get your filthy hands off my bride. Because he loves us, he craves us. Really, really wants us. Because he really, really loves us. He sure came to seek and save. He came to show us, yes, that he's the Messiah. came to do what he did, perform the miracles, but the mission was to seek and save. It was a rescue mission to pull us out of the fire. Deep, deep desire for our love. We are his beloved. Now, by the world standard, people are judged by the social standing. By the wealth, by the the car that they drive, the house that they live in, the clothes that they wear. That's not what God looks for. He's looking for your heart and a desire for him. It doesn't go past that. John. Yeshua says, I'm the vine and you're the branches. Those who stay united with me and I with them are the ones who bear much fruit. Because apart from me, you can't do anything. He's the vine. We're the branches. A, a branch has one purpose. To bear fruit. The branch doesn't live for the vine. Yeshua is being very, very specific here. The branch doesn't live for the vine. but allows the vine to live through the branch. The branches can't bear fruit without the vine. He has to live through us. Does that make sense? He just wants to use your tabernacle. That's all. We're supposed to be little Yeshua's. Let me go, Mary. Let me go. I'm going to send you the Spirit. So then there's nothing in him that we can't do. I've learned to be content regardless of circumstance. I know what it is to be in want. I know what it is 
to have more than enough. In everything, in every way, I've learned the secret of being full and being hungry, of having abundance and being in need. I can do all things through him who gives me the power. You can read, we throw that verse around for fun. Don't miss that first bit. He's telling you, any circumstance, if you're in him, you can get through it all. When we're in union with the Messiah, that should give you some passion. That should give you some zeal for the Lord. And then it's easy to follow him and in that be transformed. And it, the, the inspiration for this message was a, it, it was actually a, a car edge I saw. And it was Romans 12. It was Romans 12, like, bing, hello, McFly, wake up, <coughs> get home and do a message. What's Romans 12? In other words, don't let yourselves be conformed to the stands of the Olam Hazar, this world. Instead, keep letting yourselves be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Transformation. Here, Shaul, Paul, he's just giving you Romans 11, the grafting of the wild olive shoot being grafted into the olive tree. And now they'll now bear fruit for the Lord. Even though they were wild, they were pagan, far from God. And what he did went against nature, didn't it? You take a good olive shoot and you put that in a wild one so it would bear fruit. You don't take a wild one and put it in a good That's That's contrary to nature. But that's what God did. wasn't natural, it was supernatural. He took the wild and he put it in the natural so all would bear fruit. Jew and Gentile, one in Messiah. And back then they had no clue what he was going to do with this. Paul kind of did, but people didn't understand it. He got the revelation. They weren't expecting the Gentile influx. It was like, well, look, look, the Gentiles coming in as well. Wow. Because Yeshua had told them, go to the lost sheep of Israel. The lost sheep of Israel. In Israel. Not in Scotland somewhere. Or Germany. Or wherever. <sighs> Israel. He also said, I've got other sheep to bring in to the fold, didn't he? That's the Gentiles. It was always the plan. Always the plan. But Peter was confused. He had the vision in Acts 10. Now it was like nine years after Yeshua had ascended. And he has this vision. Oh, I've never met, I've never had anything unclean. I thought I thought you sure had told him at the start like 12 years before they can eat anything you want why is he still eating unclean for one or not he, he's eating clean he's not eating unclean ten years down the line he's ascended and, and now he's looking at the Gentiles going wow the Gentiles are coming in. That's what Acts 10 about. They're getting the Holy Spirit too. And Paul's trying to relate this to the Romans who were Gentile believers. He's relating to them that the Lord's done this, this, this great crazy thing and he's brought you into the commonwealth of Israel. Now you can claim their covenants. Now you can claim their promises. Now you can claim eternal life too. You get deliverance as well. You've got all these things. Now don't let yourselves become formed. 
and go back to what you were. Don't go back to the world. And you can't go back. That being said, you can't just stay at salvation neither. You can't just stay in neutral, kick back on a lazy boy and wait for your shoe to come back. You've got to work in the kingdom. You've gone through the door. He's the door into the kingdom. And you've got to keep moving. You've got to keep up with him. You can't sit on the fence. If you're, if you're not keeping up with him, you're falling behind. Simple as that. There's no gray area. Black and white. We all have times of being lukewarm. We all have seasons like that. But you've, you've, you've got to get to grips with it and you've got to get back in the game. Because lukewarm, you don't want to be in a lukewarm place. It's dangerous. And he don't like it. He don't like it one bit. But don't go back to what you were. Don't go back to the ways of the world. Keep letting yourselves be transformed. Present progressive principle. Being born again is a present progressive principle. We have to change. We have to be transformed. It's a process. He's chipping. It's like you're a big block of clay and he's just chipping and chipping and chipping. And sooner or later, you're going to look more like you sure. If you're not being transformed, you're being conformed. It's one or the other. You can't just kick back at salvation and wait. Salvation is just the beginning. There's this thing in the body that dictates, well, look, you're born again. Everything's sweet. Don't worry about it. And you've literally just started at that point. He says, you'll know what God wants and you'll agree that it's good. Even in the midst of a storm. Something difficult. You've got to remember who he is and keep fixed on him. That's, that's the whole deal with Pete. He gets out of the boat and he's walking on water, isn't he? But he's looking at Yeshua. He's focused on Yeshua. And then he looks around and goes, oh, the weather, the wind, the sea, ah! His circumstance takes his eyes off your shoe and sinks. But he was there, boom, immediately. Immediately. To pull him out. That's our God. Remember who he is. Don't become farmed. Your mind and your character, your creed, produces your character. Your creed, what you believe, will determine the way you walk and the way you think. How you behave, everything you think, say and do, comes from your creed. It's extremely important. To transform is to change into another form. That's what's happening. You're being transformed. When he comes, we will be like him. Like when he transfigured on the Mount of Transfiguration. He was glorified. That's the end game. That's what we're going to be too. Glorified. You've been justified. Born again. Now you're going through this process being chipped away at lifelong present progressive it's a spiritual renewal a spiritual makeover a restoration a transformation that's what it's all about keep letting yourself be transformed renewing your mind all of us with faces unveiled see as in a mirror the glory of the lord we're being changed into his very image from one degree 
of glory to the next. By the spirit of Adonai. So we look at the Bible and it's like looking in the mirror. We know what we're supposed to be, but we know we're not there, we're not there yet. But we will be. He will finish the work he started. He will. We're being changed into real deal believers and into his image. That's why you can't just stay where you are when you're born again. You're a new creation, but far from the finished article. We will be completed and we will lack nothing. And his very image from one degree to the next. Furthermore, we know that God causes everything to work together for the good of those who love him and are called in accordance with his purpose because those whom he knew in advance, he also determined in advance, would be conformed to the pattern of his son. He knew in advance. He knew he'd come into the faith and want to be conformed to the pattern of his son. That's what it's all about. That's the goal, to be like Yeshua, right? I spoke about Paul's eloquent, eloquent groan a couple of weeks back. What a miserable creature I am. What a wretched man. They call it the eloquent groan. This is the great apostle himself, shout ooh, saying this after all he did and all he went through. Very, very saved. And can anybody say that they're better than Paul? Hands up. No? Good. Because he isn't giving a license here for us to mess up either. Like, shall we sin more so grace can abound more? May it never be, heaven forbid. He's letting you know the reality of being human in the flesh. We've got to deal with the flesh. We have to be honest, as a community of faith, and sometimes admit we make mistakes. And have some compassion, some empathy, and some grace. Because chances are, you're going to mess up too, at some point. But there's this battle going on. He's trying to, to emphasise this battle going on between the spirit and the flesh, and it's driving him round the twist. He wants to be righteous. He wants to be holy all the time. And he's trying so very, very hard, but he's falling short. And it's absolutely wrecking him. Now, you could let, you could let that drive you to the point of saying, I can't do it, so what's the point? Let's not do any of it. Couldn't you? People have done that. And you give in to licentiousness. And that, that, that's, the go, that's a go to ball too. You can't go down that road. And he's saying, Who, who's going to save me from this body bound for death? Thanks be to God, because he will. Through Yeshua the Messiah. So that's where, that's the safe place. Don't be arrogant, don't be proud, don't be boastful. But don't give up either. And end up going hog wild and backslid. He's burdened by the weight of his sin in the flesh. And he wanted it to drop off and he just wants to fly. That freedom's going to come. It's coming. It's coming. We are God's children now not been made clear what we will become we do know that when he appears we'll be like him because we'll see him as he really is this is Johnny this, he was close to Yeshua he's his favourite and he didn't know what was going to happen what we do know is it's going to be greater than we can imagine and we do know We'll be just like him. And that's worth the fight. To me at least, that's worth the fight. To be just like him. No more pain. No more fear. No more tears. No more suffering. No more hate. No more guilt. It's worth the fight, isn't it? It's going to be so worth it. 
I, I can't make you believe that. But it is the season. Give yourself a Christmas present and try. How about that? <laughs> Merry Christmas. Might change your walk. So what does God say about us? He says we're ambassadors of the Messiah. In effect, God's making his appeal through us. What we do is appeal on behalf of the Messiah, be reconciled to God. We're his ambassadors. We represent Messiah. We're his messengers. Diplomatic officials of the highest rank. Sent by Yeshua as one from the kingdom of heaven. You realize who you are. To represent him and represent him well. Then people will come to faith. You've always got to be on a mission. With everybody you come into contact with, you're representing Yeshua. And they should benefit from your salvation and your role as that ambassador then, shouldn't they? It's not got to be forced. It's not got to be begrudged. Oh, God. That's no representation, is it? Remember who you are. Behave accordingly. It should just flow out of you. And when it does, the natural becomes supernatural. And we're in his wonderful light. He tells us in Peter. He's give you a light to shine. This is the festival of lights, isn't it? Well, shine your light. Shine your light before all men. And be transformed. You, you're God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved. Clothe yourselves with feelings of compassion and kindness, humility, gentleness, patience. Bear with one another. If anyone's got a complaint against someone else, forgive him. Just as the Lord's forgiven you, you must forgive. Above all these, clothe yourselves with love. It binds everything together perfectly. Let that shalom, which comes from the Messiah, be in your, in your heart. Let it be your heart's decision maker. You are called to be part of a single body. And be thankful. Let the word of the Messiah in all its richness live in you. As you teach, as you counsel each other in all wisdom. You sing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with gratitude to God in your heart. Everything you do or say, do in the name of the Lord Yeshua, giving thanks through him to God the Father. Powerful, powerful passage. You're chosen and you're dearly, dearly loved, beloved. There's a song out of the 90s. It, it says, I'm your beloved, your creation, and you love me as I am. You've called me chosen for your kingdom, unashamed to call me your own. I am beloved. Some, some people might have a hard time accepting that and think, well, he, he couldn't love me that much, could he? Well, yeah, he can, and he does. So believe it. Because it's true. So be transformed. Because you are dearly loved. Amen. Shabbat shalom, beautiful people.